Please welcome Pam Cheng, Executive Vice President, Global Operations, IT and Chief Sustainability Officer, AstraZeneca. Shannon K. O'Neill, Vice President and Senior Fellow, Council on Foreign Relations. Denny Redonnet, Deputy Director General and Chief Trade Enforcement Officer, Directorate General for Trade, European Commission, and Bloomberg's Stephanie Flanders. Hello and welcome. Global integration, globalization, it seems to me as an economist, is unstoppable. The microeconomic drivers that were pulling countries, people, companies together a few years ago through all these years of globalization, they're all still there. It's just everything else that's changed, particularly that fair wind from policymakers, from governments that the globalizing companies of this world enjoyed over the last 30 years. That's definitely gone. And instead, you have blasts of unpredictable, very bracing winds in their face um, as geopolitics, national security is increasingly forced onto that decision making um, by companies. And of course, people are questioning their, the supply chains that were developed over that period. Apple is shifting more production to India. Warren Buffett is shedding shares in the Taiwanese uh, semiconductor industry. South Korea this week passed its own CHIPS Act. It's not just the US and it's not just theoretical. These things are changing the decisions that companies make all the time. I'm really interested to get into that um, in this short uh, session, kicking off, helping to kick off the rest of the two days. Sharon O'Neill, just paint the scene for us briefly. You know, we, we've described this session as about re-globalization. I think we all accept that there's many features of globalization that are here to stay, but companies are having to respond. What's happening on the ground? Has the, has the paradigm changed as much in the last year or two as the price of money has, for example? <laughs> um, well, thank you, and, and great to be with all of you. Let me just start off talking about a little bit of how I see where we've been, because I think that baseline really matters for where we're going and where we've started to go. And so, you know, as I look at over these last 40 years, the way we think about globalization, or even the word globalization, is a little bit of a misnomer, mischaracterization. And when you look at the flows of trade and money and patents and, and all of the movement of companies, when we look at these last 40 years, we have seen more regionalization than globalization. And so just a couple data points to, to put on the table. One is that the average good that goes abroad, the average traded good, travels 3,000 miles or 5,000 kilometers. That is about the distance from New York to Los Angeles or Dublin to New York. That doesn't get you to Shanghai. It's a much closer movement than we see. The other is that what we've seen over these last 40 years of globalization, or I would say regionalization, is really the rise of three big trading regions. So between Europe, Asia, and North America, 90% of all trade happens today. So you take dozens of other countries, South America, the Middle East, Africa, South Asia, all of those together are just 10% of trade. So they have been left on the sides, really, of this last round of globalization. So now we get to where we are today, and we see technology changing supply chains. We see climate change policies beginning to shift supply chains. We see all of the geopolitics that are now accelerating, I would say, rather than fading. And that is changing this base. But we're starting from this base of very robust, particularly international supply chains with intermediate goods, right? the pieces and parts that go into final goods already very robust regional supply chains. And I think the question is, do we see these scattering or fragmenting? Does the rest of the world that's been left on the side, do they get a chance to come in? Or do we see a consolidation, really, of these three big hubs as we go forward? And I think many of these trends are going to lead us to keeping this regional structure and, and doubling down on it. Well, funnily enough, you talk about regionalization. And we do have a polling question uh, to get into this and to test what uh, everyone in the audience feels uh, on this question. So if, I, if we pull up um, the question, it's which region do you think will benefit most from regionalized supply chains? Southeast Asia, Indian subcontinent, Europe, 
or Latin America? And I'll give you a little bit of time to answer that. It's very interesting, the result on that. So there's quite a lot of belief that the Indian subcontinent is... And I, I know Prime Minister Modi would be very delighted to, <laughs> to see that. <laughs> Though he's still got a few things to fix, I think, to get there. I was in India recently and they were pointing out that while encouraging other companies to reduce their countries to reduce their vulnerability um, or dependence on China, the India itself is hugely dependent on Chinese imports, including all its toys. But that's, uh, that's very interesting. So I think we'll, we, will, we will get into some of that, uh, some of those practicalities. But Pam Cheng, what does this mean for, for Astra, AstraZeneca um, and your sector generally? Because if you think of an indus your industry is the industry that you know, one is sees most clearly some of these microeconomic forces, because as you've pointed out in our discussions, it's about people exchanging knowledge as well. It's not just um, the technology. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here today. I think, you know, globalization, that open supply chain, global supply chain is really important for the life science industry, particularly pharmaceutical supply chain. You think about the stress the pharmaceutical supply chain has been under since COVID-19, the war in Ukraine, not to mention the, the, the geopolitical tensions, if you will. Uh, you know, we, we, we don't have the luxury of saying we can temporarily stock out on our product because these products, these medicines keep people alive and help people to stay healthy. So we do everything we can to ensure that we can supply uh, our medicines in a continued way. Now, it is not unusual for a medicine supply chain to have starting materials that comes from specific countries around the world. Imagine stifling that. Imagine restricting that. It doesn't work. And I would say localizing end-to-end -end medicine supply chain is not practical. The, the investments, the resources, the, the, the time that it would take would have detrimental and negative implications for the patients around the world, not to mention the payers, if you will. And I, and I want to give a, a great recent example. AstraZeneca made 3 billion doses of COVID-19 vaccine. And it is such a modern example of how we made the impossible possible. We definitely leverage global supply chains. We had partners in Asia, Latin America, North America, and Europe. And together, we developed and supply a vaccine that normally takes five to eight years to do in less than a year, right? We supply to 180 countries around the world, two thirds of which are low and middle income countries, and not to mention we, we did it at no profit during the pandemic. So that's an example where if we had local supply chain or even regional supply chain, it would not have been possible, simply put. And is there a sort of balkanization of knowledge that's, that's risked Absolutely. I mean, just being able to leverage that scale, that resources, that le capability, that knowledge, that ability to share around the world, right? So not not to, to, to stifle that innovation and in technology advancement is critical, critical in the life science sector. Now, Denis Redonné, uh, you were described to me as one of my colleagues, by one of my colleagues as the EU's trade hammer. And actually, the way you're looking at me, I can see why he might say that. Um, but the, uh, you, are the, you are the enforcer, the EU's enforcer. But I guess a question is raised in this new world. If, if national security considerations are now impinging on trade decisions, what are you going to be enforcing in the future? If, are you enforcing President Macron's vision of a new geo-economic future, or are you able to stay within the EU's trading rules? So what we're enforcing, uh, what we're really focused on, is making sure that the frameworks that we have in place, which are rules-based, which enable the EU's integration in the global economy, uh, are preserved, are enhanced, are adhered to. Um, it is the case that we have a vast network of trade agreements out of the EU. But these agreements are only valuable if 
we inject life into them, if we maximize the benefits that flow from them, and therefore, if we ensure compliance, basically, with the commitments that our partners take and that we take. And that's really what I do. So it's not a hammer, it's not punitive, it's not protectionist, it's not closing down anything. It's about ensuring the benefits of an open markets with rules strategy, which continues to be the EU's approach. Now, the reality is that we are operating our international economic relations out of the EU in a more adverse environment, a harsher environment, where, yes, there is a hard re-entry of hard geopolitics in international economic relations right now. And we certainly have seen this uh, with Russia's uh, aggression of Ukraine, which has led us to decouple uh, our relationship on trade and investment with Russia in a very, very significant uh, manner. But what we need to do is we need to make sure that we focus on resilience in a measured and proportionate way so that we look at where we have real vulnerabilities. And the mapping we have done of this shows that the vulnerabilities of the supply chains are not wholesale, they're not immense. If you look at <coughs> EU imports from the rest of the world and try to identify in the most critical areas where is it that we have a high, very high import dependency that we cannot diversify away from and where production domestically is very difficult? This is a very, very small share, actually, of our overall trade relations. So the de-risking that we need to do is about that zone. There are other issues at play right now. There is in particular the fact that uh, there is a nexus of issues around trade and investment, emerging technologies, and national security, which is being reviewed, I think, by many jurisdictions in the United States, in Europe, in Japan, uh, because there is one concern going forward, which is going to be the risk of, of leakage of the most sensitive technologies, in particular in context where you have jurisdictions that develop, uh, for example, civil military fusion strategies. But again, that's a targeted issue. So I think what we're looking to do is to maintain a trade policy which is based on, on openness, which is based on sustainability, which is assertive, where we need to be assertive and defend our rights but certainly not one which is going to be closing down unnecessarily uh, our trade and investment relationships with the rest of the world. I mean, Shannon, the sort of <coughs> Denis is kind of is living the conflict between the kind of old ver vision of how global trading institutions ought to work with WTO, others, and the reality which is now countries kind of freelancing and um, making strategic choices about uh, relocations. You know, what is, uh, is there going to continue to be a role for these kind of international um, federated institutions or the WTO in this new world, or are we just going to lose that? There is, a role f there is a role for these various trade organizations. I mean, one thing we have seen over these last five years is really a um, significant ambition and also activity in the free trade space less from the WTO right from from but we have seen so many free trade agreements signed really over these last several years we've seen you know in Asia you have the CPTPP you have RCEP so you have various agreements there in Africa you have a continental free trade agreement the EU has been out signing agreements with Canada and with Mercosur and South America and other places so you really have seen sort of a restructuring or an ambition to restructure the global architecture and many of these agreements uh, are um, much broader and deeper and more ambitious than, than some of the things in the WTO, right? You have things about government procurement and about anti-corruption and about regulations and all sorts of things. So I do think you are seeing these various, you are seeing people try to set the rules on, on the stage, even as you have governments then also intervening through industrial policy. And I think that it really is the hallmark of the last number of years is setting these rules on a regional basis office or a smaller group of a club of a smaller group of countries um, where you have a baseline but then also governments trying to put their finger on the scale to influence commercial decisions of businesses and make things either cheaper to do them in certain ways or more expensive and adding frictions if you do it in the ways that they have been done for a long time. And I think that is the interplay that we're seeing and that we're at the beginning of rather than the end of mm -hmm. as I look out into the 2020s. But, 
Pam, I guess one of the things that's different about some of these uh, groupings is they're not just creatures of convenience. There's also now an element of sort of values-based divisions between you know different different factions in the global economy, or certainly between sort of China, the China sphere and the U.S. sphere, if that's where we're heading. I just wonder when you're when you're doing your long-term planning now, are you thinking about the way you organise yourselves globally in a different way? I think, in general, it's a great question, and it's a question that many companies are wrestling with, right? Strategically, again, going back to my comment around the importance of global supply chain, we still think of our supply chain longer term as global in nature. We're not contemplating localizing supply chains or regionalizing supply chains as a whole. Now, in terms of, 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 of the tactics we are taking and, and the elements we are thinking about is, you know, coming out of COVID and, and with all the challenges we have right now, the supply chain is fragile. So how do we ensure supply chain resilience is a key topic. Now, there's multiple ways to ensure supply chain resilience. It could be multi-sourcing, which is one of the things that we deploy the industry does. So multi-sourcing for the same medicine, for example, you can source part of it from China, you can source part of it from Europe and US, for example. We've got the largest part of our manufacturing footprint in Europe, per se, and here in, in, in Ireland, um, in, in terms of a specific country. So I think it's really thinking about that supply chain resilience around multi-sourcing, being able to locate, co-locate capabilities in more than one country, if you will not so much around localizing the entire supply chain in China or in the West or whatever the case may be, but continue to leverage that globalness, capabilities and scale. And how is, I mean, the war, the war in Russia or the, the invasion of Ukraine has um, sort of accelerated some of this in a way, but also just fundamentally um, ruptured trading relations uh, across, uh, across Europe and between you know, many countries. I mean, Denny, do you think that, what do you think will the, the lasting impact of that will be for, for supply chains and for the way people think about those rules? Because of course, for some, it becomes, it, feel, it feels as though um, there's, a, there's a cudgel that is being wielded uh, by the US now. It, the, the neg there's a lot of negativity around a US-led system that comes with the, some of the extremity of some of those sanctions, however justified? I think the situation with respect to Russia is a, is a very specific one. I mean, for Europe, it's an existential moment. It's an ex existential threat. It's an unbelievable breach of public international law. It required uh, the sort of deep response that Europe uh, United has been able, together with uh, 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 a, a, um, an alliance a sanctioning uh, coalition has managed to, to put into play. We, you know, at the end of 2021, in a way, we were kind of still thinking our, probably our biggest challenge is going to be some sort of a very incremental and partial deintegration between the US and China. And suddenly, in, you know, in February 24th, we, we, uh, we experienced a brutal and almost immediate decoupling between us and Russia. Um, that was very surprising. Um, it's a very unique experiment in, in economic deintegration that we're experiencing with the Russia sanctions. It is absolutely necessary because it is degrading Russia's uh, capabilities through the trade sanctions, but it's by no means a, a, a model. I think it does not mean that we cannot maintain and shore up a rules-based economic system. As a matter of fact, the EU is doing its best to shore up that system. You know, the WTO is under stress. The WTO has been, in part, paralyzed in its dispute settlement function, which is, of course, at the core, because it's what ensures that its rules remain binding. We have taken steps to shore it up, to create a stopgap for the dysfunctional uh, appellate body for the dispute resolution system. So it is important to continue to have the WTO and the institutions as guardrails. And at the same time, where they are falling short or where they are under excessive stress, well, we have as EU to be able to navigate that new reality. And that's why we need to have, in some cases, a number of autonomous instruments to, to protect our, our interests. 
were concerned, for example, by the phenomenon of the weaponization of dependencies, right? So these supply chain links, which uh, can be abused uh, uh, by uh, governments. Uh, we have decided to equip ourselves with a, a legal statute to be able to deter these kinds of behaviors by third countries vis-a-vis -vis the EU or one of its member states. That's just being realistic about the fact that we are in a more degraded environment and at the same time what we should do is try to continue to shore up what works from the rules-based system and certainly not contribute to eroding it further. And very, just very briefly, you mentioned the enforcement mechanism. Quite a lot of, um, there's quite a lot of interest in whether or not the WTO is going to have an enforcement system, maybe next year. Um, what do you think? What are the chances? I think it is very possible to re-establish a third-party adjudication system that works, that is binding, that has an appeal uh, mechanism. We have indicated that we are ready to consider reform of that system, that pillar of the WTO. By putting in place the stop, stop gap that we have put in place with a number of countries has actually shown that it is possible to envisage a reconfigured uh, uh, system. For us, that is an absolute priority, yes, because we have to have uh, the WTO remaining as the multilateral baseline acting as a guardrail against tendencies that we see for, towards more protectionism uh, and in some cases towards weaponization of, of, uh, of economic links. Shannon, do you think we'll end up, um, whatever the justification, um, will there be a, a sort of darker legacy to some of the, the very extreme measures that have been taken against Russia? things that we've not done before, whether it's seizing of central bank reserves and other things. You know, the rest of the world is watching, not always participating, many of them not participating. Is there, is there a cost from that? And there is a cost. There would be a cost if we hadn't reacted. Um, let, let, let's be real here, right? We, it wasn't a proactive stance by, by those against. It was, it was a reaction to, to the invasion itself. Um, but I think there are some legacies. We see them in the short term in food insecurity, in energy insecurity, especially in emerging markets in you know, the global south where there's real challenges that are affecting you know, daily lives but affecting politics and, and you know, democratic governments and others all around the world. So there's definitely that right now that's a darker side. Uh, and I think there then is a question, you know, we see lots of articles and, and, and exclamations about de-dollarization of the system, you know, I'll, I'll believe it when I see it, but, um, but there is obviously in policymakers and those who want more independence who are worried about being drawn into these things and um, there is a, is a challenge there. Um, one thing I do think, though, as we talk about this, you know, are we going to, you know, push for localization and, and push for governments, you know, trying to, to force supply chains to move in various places? I do think what we are going to find is that outside of a very few industries and sectors, governments are not going to be willing to subsidize indefinitely production that brings it home or brings it to allies. And so the benefits of international supply chains that we've seen over 40 years from economies of scale, from specialization, from innovation and the like, those aren't gonna go away. And so if you don't have an international supply chain, you will be beat out by competitors who do. And I think that is the challenge that, that companies are caught in right now is they're being pressured by governments to do certain things and, and, and you know, being encouraged to move. Um, but if they have global competitors, which they will, um, they're going to have to have this international landscape and, and footprint. Th there's a question which brings out, I was going to say there's, you know, one big piece of this that we haven't talked about. We've talked about the sort of rise of economic statecraft impinging on globalization and we've talked about <laughs> Russia. But the question is, how does climate change affect mm. current and future supply chains? Pan I know that. So I'm passionate about this topic, <laughs> right? And I, I think agendas aside, the climate crisis is the largest crisis of our lifetime in the 21st century. Uh, and I don't know if you all know, but nearly 14 million people die each year because of environmental health risk, including 7 million people die of air pollution alone. And we really need to rally. I mean, I think the Russian um, energy crisis, for example, brings sort of forward in terms of the importance of green energy, right? Importance of driving that, making the change in that climate crisis that we have right now. I mean, if you look at AstraZeneca, we took a huge bold step a couple of years ago to declare our $1 billion investment, Ambition Zero Carbon, where we have publicly declared that by 2025, 
our scope one and two will be, in terms of greenhouse gas emission, will be reduced by 98%. So effectively going down to near zero by 2025. And then reducing our end-to-end -end value chain, which includes scope three, by half by 2030. And then getting to um, net zero by 2045. So we've stepped forward, but this is not something one company, one industry, one government can do. This is something that public-private uh, partnership, sort of the world rallying together to really make a difference in this biggest health crisis. We're going we're gonna to run out of time, so I wanted to get both of your, your response on this. But there, there, are, there are two theories. I mean, in a sense, the carbon transition um, has been weaponized itself, obviously, with the IRA and potential responses from, from Europe and other countries. There's a theory that says that's great. The more energy we have, the more companies, countries we have competing to do more, to speed the transition, the better. Um, but another view says we've never needed global, a global approach more than in response to this challenge. Shannon, briefly, what side are you on? I, mean, I think the real politic is we can't, we don't have a global approach and we haven't been able to find one and given all the other geopolitics, it's hard for me to see us coming together on that. So to me, you know, the step forward, the IRA is climate policy, it's not necessarily industrial policy or, or that the benefits are. Um, and I think other countries stepping forward and doing that and companies as well stepping forward, um, you know, the first best would be a global solution, but if we can't do that, then I would say each needs to step forward as, as some places are. Denise, some of the challenges you talked about at the start come through with this response to the IRA. Yeah, I think the green transition is, is, is actually requiring a lot of regulatory change in many parts of the world. So, of course, in terms of trade investment, international economic relations, what matters is that there is as much as possible convergence between these regulatory developments as opposed to divergence, because divergence will create inevitably uh, attention. It's not just, by the way, a question of industrial policy, there's a whole range of regulatory policies across a whole suite of, of areas that, that is at play here. I, I think that what we certainly don't want to see is subsidy raised to the bottom. That's very clear. We need to have the mechanisms in place for cooperation to avoid this. That's why we have a Trade and Technology Council with the United States that needs to play its role and continue to play its role in avoiding unnecessarily regulatory uh, divergence. The other thing I would say on this is that there's a lot of talk uh, about the Brussels effect, about the fact that, you know, because we're a big market, we can basically, you know, just export our regulatory uh, uh, model when it comes to the green transition, for example, or, or other areas. I think we are very conscious in the EU that we have to continue to engage in international regulatory cooperation. That is the one way that it will enable us to avoid trade investment tensions further down the road. We have so much to talk about and we don't have any more time. Um, but thank you so much to all of you, Denny Waldoné, Shannon O'Neill and Pam Cheng. And uh, let's continue the conversation. Thank you. Thank you.